Good afternoon once again. So, uh, just to summarize, uh, just for uh, the people who were not there yesterday, uh, we had a look at the dispersion models because we had stopped uh, with the source models last week. Then we had discussed further about the dispersion models and the parameters which affect the dispersion uh, uh, as such. Okay, starting from wind velocity, atmospheric conditions, and uh, uh, buoyancy, and what else? Uh, another two more uh, we had discussed. Ground condition. Exactly, ground condition, and one more. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you are right. So height of uh, release. Okay, so all these uh, five key parameters define the uh, the rate of dispersion when there is a leak or a loss of containment release. Okay. So, and then we had gone ahead and discussed about the stability conditions, what are the different uh, types of uh, or categories of stability, then the different types of wind velocities like uh, high, medium, low, okay, and then how we select uh, the wind velocity along with the stability class for doing our studies, right, and then we had uh, gone ahead and discussed about the, the density factor which helps in the buoyancy or the momentum created between the uh, lighter gases and the heavier uh, air or vice versa okay and then the we had a look at the case study of uh, the bunsfield uh, fire tank fire and explosion where the trees were uh, aiding in the explosion right as a congestion which uh, the trees which created a congestion and then aiding the explosion okay so uh, then we had a look at the height of release we had a look at the stack the examples of stack and things like that okay so then then we had gone ahead little further uh, we had a look at the equations which govern the calculations uh, dispersion calculations okay so where uh, we started uh, with the two major uh, types one is plume and puff okay and then uh, plume again these two plume and puff with wind uh, without wind and with eddy uh, diffusivity and without eddy diffusivity and all these variations we had discussed yesterday uh, and just we had a look at some two three equations out of the 15 equations uh, to get an idea and we had discussed about the factors which will vary for each case right so i hope you remember all these things right so now uh, moving further have, uh, then i think we had discussed about the fire and explosion models also right after source dispersion fire and explosion models uh, and toxic uh, effects. So, we had a look at the fire and explosion model. I, I just gave an idea of what all the models that will be considered or the equations that will be considered for uh, fire modeling and uh, explosion modeling, right. You remember, I, I hope so, right. The TNO, TNT, Becker Strollo for explosion and APA and cone model for uh, the uh, fire uh, model, okay. So, after uh, having done uh, these calculations, we have the results with us. Those are the results of what in this formula? Risk is consequence into or severity into probability or, or uh, as it is mentioned here likelihood into severity, right. So, so we had calculated the severity, the consequence, uh, impact. Okay, and earlier in the last two sessions in the last week, we had discussed about the probability theory, frequency and the use of that probability theory in ETA and FTA, right. So, combining those two, uh, frequency into uh, consequence or likelihood into severity. Is it leaking? Or? Oh. Okay. So, combining both two will give us the, the risk as such. Okay. So, here uh, we are quantifying the risk based on the results what we get out of the consequence analysis as well as the probability analysis. We normally term it as frequency analysis, some people call it as likelihood analysis, some people call it as uh, um, probability analysis. Okay. So, as you see, uh, you could see there risk depends on consequence results, base event frequency, ignition probability, weather conditions and comes your population density. Okay, so, till now whatever we have discussed is the estimation of frequency 
and estimation of the effects consequence right but the last one we haven't discussed population so that's how we are do you remember the example what i had uh, picked up last week the car example crashing a car against someone how many people getting impacted so the number of people factor right so that factor has to be factored in into our calculations okay so we need to have the population details so when we do the analysis we do collect the details of the population that are there inside the factory or inside the plant as well as outside the plant or in and around the plant nearby areas so uh, we classify it into two when we say uh, with the population which is there directly connected to the operations we call them as individual risk okay and the people who are not connected to the operations are termed under or calculated under societal risk i'll just go in detail about that in the next slide okay so when we say risk we will will be normally calculating individual risk and the societal risk okay and for this individual risk we need to have the population details of the people connected with the operations and for societal risk we need to have the populations not connected with the operations okay which is uh, defined here so whatever i had explained right now so individual risk is something directly connected to the operations okay and uh, and the third one what you could see there is location specific individual risk again uh, there will be multiple units inside a plant or a industry or in, inside a factory okay so again we may need to uh, calculate the specific risk involved in uh, specific risk to the population in a particular area inside the plant you might be aware of the facilities inside a factory right control room will be there maintenance building will be there right some operational team some other operations uh, building will be there like the people who go into the field they will be uh, positioned in some other operational building so all these facilities will have some amount or some number of people housed inside the building okay so that particular location the risk will be calculated when the risk is calculated it is uh, termed as location specific individual risk instead of calculating it on a whole location wise if we go for calculating the individual risk it will be lsir okay and then the potential loss of life is a fallout of that particular value from lsir we will be calculating uh, we will be identifying the risk value of that particular location and then when we multiply it with the number of people occupied in that or located in that building it will be the potential loss of life like how 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 many people could get impacted okay so when we say all these calculations totally it's it's related to fatality death no injury or uh, uh, um, the other terms are being considered in this so when we say risk it's fatality okay so and again when uh, the fatality it is calculated in terms of per year average getting my point like how many fatalities can happen in a year or how may, how much duration it will take for one fatality to happen either way like it may take 10 years for a fatality to happen there as per calculations or Uh, in a year two fatalities or three fatalities can happen depending upon the risk so that is the uh, number what we derive out of this particular analysis okay so how many people can die because of this particular risk okay and how many people involved in the operations can die because of this risk is individual risk and how many people who are not connected uh, not connected with this operation who can die is societal risk okay but there are there is a variance in this some some guidelines or some standards uh, state it differently i need to rec- uh, submit uh, here the other uh, version or other uh, opinion also when we say individual risk uh, what they term it as one person one one single person getting impacted by any of the outcome events okay what is the outcome events yesterday we had discussed what are the outcome events fire explosion yeah, yeah that is coming under explosion so fire explosion toxic dispersion okay do you remember that i i was just so showing the event tree 
where I said uh, jet fire, pool fire, vapor cloud explosion, unignited release, oh, all these are termed as outcome events. So, uh, one person dying because of any of these events is individual risk and all the events put together, uh, sorry, one, one event uh, leading to death of how many people, that is considered under societal risk. So, these do, two variances are there across the industry. Some people go with the first uh, definition, whatever I had termed, some guidelines and some standards uh, stated in this manner. Okay, so, for ease of purpose, I again I, I am going back to the earlier uh, definition. Individual risk is the one where uh, the value gives the fatalities of the people who are connected to the operations and societal risk is not connected to the operations. Okay? Uh, fine. So, uh, okay. So, when we say um, uh, individual risk, we will, we will be getting individual risk in numbers, okay, and then what you can see is this, this is how we plot using the software. I will just take you through the software also a little bit, not much, uh, not here, just I will just uh, take you through what exactly the software does or how it does. Huh? Okay, so, we will, we will be plotting the uh, individual risk uh, as such in the layouts, plot plan or layouts. Uh, this, the, these are the contours which is indicating the number of uh, fatalities per average year. Okay? And you can uh, this, see, uh, th there is a difference in the, uh, the colors. So, each color has its own uh, value, this many number of fatalities per year. Okay, so, when we, when we do this analysis, we will be uh, seeing whether any contour is intersecting any other facilities nearby and if it is so, then we will be suggesting for some additional measures to retain the facility or to relocate the facility depending upon the risk. Okay? And this is the one which you see normally for societal risk, we do not, we cannot give in numbers. Okay? It is just society. Okay? So, we normally say is uh, F and curve, this is the, this is the number of fatalities in x axis and y axis is frequency. Okay, so, frequency versus uh, number of fatalities gives us the societal risk and it is always represented in this fashion, in F and curve, we call it as F and curve and from F and curve we will be uh, picking out the values. Like if, you, if I want to know uh, how, how frequently 10 people can die because of some problem in the inside the factory, then I will go with the 10 number 10 and then I will see the intersection and take the frequency from there. And if I want to know how, how frequently 100 people can die, then again I will go back to this same graph. From 100, I will take the intersection and pick up the value for uh, frequency. Okay, so, this, this is how we, uh, how, uh, how and where it is used, I will just come to that when we move further. Because uh, regulators use this information for giving approvals for projects, government authorities. Okay. So, normally yesterday we had discussed about the assessment, right? You have your, your assessments uh, being carried out in your class after the completion of module. So, same way uh, after calculating the values, risk values, we need to compare it with some, some standard. Okay. So, till now, till the last slide whatever we have done is analysis. We have, we have completed the risk analysis, we came up with the risk values, one is IR individual risk values and the second one is societal risk values. Okay, now, we are, go, we are going to assess these values with against some standard. Okay? So, uh, there are some guidelines uh, like uh, CPR 18E, uh, which we call it as purple book, which I had referred last uh, sessions, few sessions. And then uh, there are some other uh, guidelines, uh, even company, the companies, uh, big companies like uh, BP and Shell, they have their own guidelines, values. They will say, uh, this many people dying out of our operation is acceptable to us. Okay. And they will say, beyond this, it is not acceptable. And be, be between the accept acceptable and unacceptable level, there will be a band. Okay? If the risk falls in that band, they will try to push it to the acceptable limits. Okay? That is how companies operate. So, it is not possible that uh, there will be no risk at all in, in any of the oil and gas installations for that matter or any other process industries which handle hazardous chemicals. Okay? There will be some residual risk, some risk will be there. 
but we need to assess whether the operations can continue with the 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 risk as a acceptable risk like we need to accept the risk and proceed with the operations but to what extent that is what has to be decided right so how this is arrived is uh, the the companies they go with their own history of uh, accidents and collect other uh, databases also information from other databases they collate everything and see for this nature of operation how frequently this fatality happens okay so based on that they will fix a baseline okay uh, where they say this is acceptable and this is unacceptable it's not that they are not, they are accepting uh, people to die it's not so they will fix the bar higher so that it will not happen at all from their operations okay when i said uh, acceptable uh, durga was uh, <laughs> little bit uh, it's not so okay uh, they will not accept anything but they will fix the bar higher so that it will not happen at all okay so that particular bar is the one what you can see in the red uh, here so this is a typical uh, risk uh, acceptance uh, graph or a diagram where the 10 power minus 3 is unacceptable beyond this is unacceptable okay and uh, 10 power minus 5 sorry 10 power uh, minus 5 is acceptable and 10 power minus 3 is unacceptable between 10 power minus 3 and minus 5 is in between we we use a terminology called alarp as slow as reasonably practicable okay so whenever a risk whatever we had calculated when the risk value is falling in this range in, in the range of 10 power minus 4 we will try to push it to the uh, green band okay that's our uh, the, the final activity what we do as a risk assessor or a risk analyst okay we'll be seeing the values if it is beyond 10 power minus 5 so beyond 10 power minus 5 in the sense what is the, what what all uh, what all values will be beyond 10 power minus 5 less than 10 power minus 5 yeah minus 6 minus because there uh, people normally get confused okay so it's in that order 10 power minus 6 minus 7 minus 8 or negligible acceptable okay and 10 power minus 2 minus 1 is severe okay so 10 power we when the values what we get is 10 power minus 4 then we will try to push it to 10 power minus 5 or uh, higher than that okay higher in the sense value wise okay uh, frequency wise lesser G- getting my point okay so so these these three terminologies uh, will define the acceptability of the risk acceptability acceptable unacceptable and alarm okay so when we when i said alarp uh, something has to be given to reduce that alarp to acceptable right some measures has to be given or provided or suggested from our side to reduce it from 10 power minus 4 to minus 5 or minus 6 or further okay so these are some of the typical uh, measures what we used to provide and it's it, it is not restricted to this still more will be there depending upon the nature of the system we used to do that like say sometimes we ask them to provide a a uh, higher reliable uh, instrumentation loop okay do you remember the reliability whatever we were discussing so one order higher will, will be pushing the risk order to next level from 10 power minus 5 to minus 6 or minus 7 okay so we will be asking for a higher high, higher uh, reliability for a instrumentation loop or uh, sometimes we will ask them to go for a higher thickness in the pipe whatever is being used because when we sense that the, th- the leak rate and the and subsequently the risk level is more in that then we'll go ask them to go for a higher level of thickness okay in the pipe design okay and sometimes we can we, we will increase uh, we will suggest this kind of uh, other measures like cathodic protection have you heard about cathodic protection yeah. okay so you you know the process of uh, corrosion right what is that uh, happens uh, in a corrosion what are the nature of reaction that happens over there Oxidation. oxidation reduction happens right okay so to stop that what is that required we need to give a coat coating of a of a metal that does not corrode corrode that does not react with the environment ha ah, so that is uh, that will act as a film okay so apart from that because that's a, that's a, the naturally the ion movement happens there right 
So to stop that ion movement, uh, one is providing a barrier there, okay, that's uh, coating whatever you had suggested. Another method is to divert the ions to somewhere else, right? Instead of uh, to the proximate ones, you can divert it to something else if you provide something else, right? Say for example, there is a movement of positive ions to negative ions. Okay, if you provide another post, uh, another negative uh, 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 system or element there, it can attract the positive ions and it will re reduce the movement this side, right? Got it? So that is what is done in cathodic protection. Okay, so they will they will provide another uh, uh, element over there in the system which will attract this movement of ions towards that. So that it will it will restrict the corrosion that happens in the pipelines. Okay, so automatically what will happen? The failure rate will come down. Failure rate of pipeline will come down. So your frequency will come down. Frequency of failure will come down. When you multiply it with the severity, automatically your risk level will come down. So this is how we calibrate all the uh, risk values. So by suggesting additional measures, but it it's, uh, it doesn't limit it to this. Like it goes goes on and on. Depending upon the system and the nature of operations and the type of uh, measures they have with them, what all additional we can do, we'll suggest and we'll try to bring down the risk there. Okay, so sometimes uh, it's not possible at all. We cannot uh, reduce the risk. We will not be in a position to reduce the risk. Then what we will do is we will ask them to reduce the inventory quantity stored in that particular location. Okay, so that what will come down if you reduce the quantity? Going by the logic, the risk equal to uh, probability into consequence or likelihood into severity. When you re reduce the quantity of the chemical inside the tank, severity. exactly, severity will come down, right? So we will play around this. We will try to reduce the frequency or try to reduce the consequence, whichever is possible in that system and try to reduce the risk. Okay? You got the logic? That's how we suggest recommendations when we close the analysis or the assessment, okay? Okay, so now uh, having discussed all these things, uh, you, you would have uh, got an idea of how, how much quantum of assumptions we are making, right? Starting from your failure frequency uh, calculations, your, uh, yesterday we were discussing about something about parts count, ignition probabilities, do you remember? Right, so we are doing. Uh, just can you imagine how many assumptions we are doing till now? Uh, we have discussed till now in the last three sessions. Almost 80% of the job is assumptions, right? The assumption of data. Okay, so we need to assure that or uh, ensure that that the assumption made by us are valid or holds good, right? So that uh, to ensure that or to validate the assumptions, we go for this final analysis. We call it as sensitivity analysis. We vary all the parameters, do this, give some variations in the parameters. Okay, like as I said, we will be assuming some wind stability and wind velocity. So we'll vary the wind velocity and wind stability. We'll vary the release direction, as I said, uh, horizontal and vertical. When we had assumed as vertical release, then we will assume it uh, again as horizontal. Just samples we'll pick up from the same analysis. We'll vary all the parameters and see what is the results that we are getting out of it. Okay, and if the, if the results are going away from our, uh, you do, you, we do the iterations, no? To narrow down that to the minimal error uh, condition in our analysis, normal analysis, right? You know, even in polynomial equation, we do that, right? Getting my point? So same iterations, uh, the, the, the idea behind this sensitivity analysis is something similar to that. So we change all the parameters, all the assumptions, and see whether all the assumptions made by us holds good or valid. Okay, this is the latest in industry. Uh, we don't uh, do this for Indian clients. Uh, okay, it's getting recorded. <laughs> uh, this is being asked by overseas uh, clients as of now. Uh, this practice is not there till now in India. Okay, so uh, unless until the client asks for it, we will not be going for this analysis because it adds up to the duration of uh, entire study. Okay. <coughs> so as I had mentioned, failure frequencies, release orientation, impact distance, ignition probability, right? Everything is there. 
okay so we will be doing the sensitivity analysis okay this is having discussed all these qra this many uh, number of hours we need, we need to know where exactly we are using this qra right this quantitative risk assessment okay so these are some of the key areas or key purpose or uh, the key objectives of doing a qra like starting from the design evaluation okay uh, where where we evaluate the design design in terms of like the whether the pipeline thickness is okay whether the tank uh, sizing is correct whether the the location of the particular i uh, will come to that location first thing is we will go with the design of all the systems okay capacity and the material of selection material of construction moc selection all these will be assessed using a qra result okay they will they will they will use our inputs to decide whether the uh, design uh, the design is valid okay so we will be giving all the inputs to the designers to do the evaluation of their design second is fire risk assessment here what we do is we are doing we are calculating the uh, the fire and explosion uh, result uh, modeling models right we are using fire and explosion models to calculate the values so with that they will uh, take up the inputs from there they will decide whether uh, the particular fire protection is required in that place or not do you remember the uh, yesterday's discussion of the structures fire proofing of structures okay it is part of this particular objective whether the fire proofing is required or the structure has to be fire uh, fire proof or the the particular uh, structure has to be uh, to which the structure has to withstand withstand this much hours of uh, fire resistant uh, fire fire all these uh, calculations will be done and this will be going as a input to the fire risk assessment okay and third one is the fire and gas deduction uh, mapping again uh, this is another fallout of the study where we give the values of the dispersion how far the concentration this particular concentration will be reached okay so based on that they will position the leak detectors are you aware of the leak detectors gas deduction system right uh, it's uh, many many techniques are there you might be aware of something which you are using in the laboratories also like semiconductor catalytic combustion electrochemical are you aware of these uh, techniques right so detectors multiple de detection systems are there which is which works in different principles so all these detectors the end result is they need to detect the leak and give an alarm either an alarm or to command the valves isolation valves or some other emergency system okay so to locate that uh, leak detector we need to know how far the dispersion will be and to what extent the dispersion will be so based on that we will give the values like uh, the detector has to be positioned in this particular location at this height at this location all these details we will be giving so that is another uh, objective emergency planning okay so having discussed this something had happened okay fire had happened or you, you, you remember yesterday's video that um, one truck was entering the refinery uh, when the blast had happened fire had happened okay so same kind of thing so if it happens some uh, the people has to respond the people has to ev evacuate from there okay so how to evacuate say if they uh, just for example you just imagine if they are evacuating and uh, starting to move out uh, in the same direction where from the uh, explosion is happening then what will happen they will be the first victim for that right so they need to take the alternate route okay so all these will be given in our uh, reports like to which route they need to take again that is a separate study follow out of qra we call it as eera escape evacuation and rescue analysis so we will use this results and plot the routes which they need to take to move out of that particular facility within the short period of time and we will give the timing also how much time they they need to they will take to move out of that facility from that particular point because we know dist uh, length and uh, we know we'll have all the dimensions right so we'll be calculating this and uh, how uh, early the impact will be and how early they need to move out to save uh, safeguard themselves so that is another uh, purpose public liability this is what i had mentioned whenever there is a new project the government will ask for a qra report okay to clear the projects and when they say clear uh, first and foremost they will look at the societal risk say for example there is a chemical industry coming up in a particular area okay so the application will be supported by our report first thing they will see 
what are the villages or the ha the habitation nearby and what is the impact to those uh, people or habitation if something goes wrong inside the factory okay this is again uh, it, it it got sensitized after uh, bhopal incident because this was uh, not sturdy at that point of time okay so they will know uh, okay this many number of villages this many uh, people are there and in 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 the event of any emergency these people will get affected so what is the alternate or what is the plan for safeguarding them okay so say in terms of uh, the fire protection facilities fire fire stations uh, their emergency supplies and uh, say uh, uh, for example this bhopal gas uh, if you see uh, at the time of release if the people would have been aware of this mic characteristics uh, what is the simplest thing that they could have done as a chemical engineer do you know the characteristics of mic is it miscible in water soluble in water it is it's highly soluble in water so uh, e uh, just just by just uh, making the handkerchief or some cloth wet if they would have closed the nose they could have saved themselves okay it's a simple uh, uh, response measure or uh, uh, planning emergency planning right which was not uh, made aware to those people which could have helped them to save themselves at least they, uh, we could have avoided uh, 3000 fatalities or we could have reduced it little further okay so these kind of things uh, will be decided based on our report this qra report will give an idea of uh, this much impact will be to these people and these 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 measures should be there in in case this event occurs in case fire occurs in case a toxic chemical uh, releases or in case an explosion happens this is the measure that has to be there in place if the if the operator of the, or if the owner of the particular uh, firm if he if he is not ready to commit for that the government will not clear the project okay so public liability is another key thing uh, which uh, takes input from qra okay and then the facility siting this this day in day out whatever study we do it ends up or boils down to facility siting like if i say this tank uh, if it explodes uh, it will have an impact on the nearby tank then i will say this tank has to be moved a little bit so now in the recent uh, days there are standards which give the uh, standard values like one tank should be this many meters away from this tank okay it's not so then the it's not so that it will not get affected it will definitely it will get affected but to certain extent they are providing some safe separation okay so what we do is we validate that separation distances because the designer will say that i am going to locate these facilities in this this areas these are the separation distances as per our plan so what i will do is after doing the analysis after taking the results i will try to superimpose on the layout and see whether it holds good okay if something explodes here i say a distillation column explodes what will be the impact or whether it will have an impact on the nearby structure okay so that uh, analysis will be done for facility siting okay so maybe just i will discuss with you some few case uh, histories or studies whatever we had carried out some multiple uh, variations so that you will get an idea how we do and what uh, what for we are doing that okay i'll just take some two three examples one is uh, uh, that is an oil and storage oil and gas storage terminal okay second is a process uh, industry a pharmaceutical industry okay because totally a different uh, scenario there okay and third is a, a major refinery which is totally again different from the other two okay i'll just explain you no slides i'll just explain you how we did that and what is the outcome of that study okay uh, so when we say this oil and gas storage terminal it will have multiple tankages okay and oil has to come from somewhere and oil has to go to somewhere right to come from somewhere trucks will be used rail wagons will be used right because that is how it is transported either road or by rail sometimes by ship also water also we do analysis for them also let us take uh, the case of road and rail okay so uh, by road tankers are bringing the petroleum products uh, by rail uh, wagons are bringing the petroleum products so it will be removed using a pump it will be stored inside the tanks 
and whenever it is it has to be transported to the end users like us to petrol pumps or wherever it is it will be again using a pump it will be transferred to the trucks or the rail wagons it will not be rail wagons it will be trucks only because you would have seen the tankers oil tankers it will be transported to the particular end user okay so in this entire chain we need to assess the risk that is what we normally pick it up from there so we will be assessing the quantity involved in the tanker in the rail wagon in the storage tank okay and then uh, till the tanker move moving out of that particular premises okay so we will be analyzing we will be picking up the systems we will be sectionalizing the systems you do you remember yesterday we were talking about the isolatable section from one end to the from a to b it has to be considered under the parts count do you remember it right so the, uh, likewise we will be sectionalizing the entire system when we sectionalize we will see to it that that particular system if at all if something goes wrong it is in total it will end within that particular uh, section okay so we will consider tanker as a section from tanker to the storage tank one section and storage tank itself as a separate section okay and then we will be going ahead with the counting of parts as i said yesterday we will be counting how many valves are there how many flanges are there how many pumps are there in between how many instrumentation connections are there like pressure gauges temperature gauges flow meters all these connections will be counted one by one in the drawings so we'll come up with the number of parts and the, and then we will pick up the failure frequencies for these parts from the databases okay so there are freq failure frequency databases where from we'll get a failure frequency for flange for a pump for a instrumentation connection everything we'll be getting from the database then we'll be collating everything then we'll be coming up with the final failure base frequency that is a base frequency it's not the final failure frequency the base frequency okay then we'll be going ahead with the selection of ignition probabilities okay we'll see what are the possibilities of ignition in that storage terminal okay the, uh, obviously what will be the uh, ignition source in that terminal in this nature of operations whatever i told now the leakage might be source ignition source source of ignition oil fuel static electricity exactly static electricity pump okay the electrical connections in a pump right or some other electrical fixtures yeah yeah you are saying something baskar yeah ha huh, exactly yeah yeah obviously that can also be considered uh, that had happened in some some places it case histories are there okay so even human intervention is also considered okay so all these probabilities are there again captured in the databases institute of petroleum has a database from there we pick up the ignition probability for each type of system each each type of system depending upon the nature of operation okay again that probabilities will be picked up we'll be going ahead with the e event tree analysis to come up with the final outcome events like how frequently jet fire can happen how frequently explosion can happen how frequently pool fire can happen all these uh, failure final failure frequencies will be pick, uh, calculated that will be kept aside okay then these sections will be used for consequence analysis so what we will be doing for consequence analysis where from we will start go ahead with the models uh, you just go back and recollect your uh, this thing uh, your memories models so leaks types of leaks right source model it starts from the source model okay we'll start with the source model we'll select the type of leak whether it is a leak from the pipeline leak from the tanker leak from the storage tank okay and then we'll move ahead with the dispersion models so we'll calculate uh, we'll see nat the nature of dispersion and we'll calculate the rate of dispersion based on that whether the wind wind is aiding in that dispersion whether diffusivity is possible whether trees are there a congestion is there all these will be used for calculations okay and then moving further we will we have calculated the, we have seen the event outcomes right fire explosion all these things so we will be again going for that particular model whether fire model or say our explosion model is required or not sometimes uh, in these oil and gas streams we will have hydrogen sulfide h2s so it's it's a toxic chemical right so we'll add that we'll go for toxic modeling also okay so these four models source dispersion fire and explosion and toxic toxic effects using this we'll come up with the consequence value okay 
consequence value it will be when you say consequence value it will be either in radiation intensity levels or over pressure levels or toxicity levels getting my point either it will be radiation intensity or uh, explosion over pressures or toxicity levels okay so uh, either uh, either uh, any any one of these will be there with us when it, when you say fire it will be radiation intensity when you say explosion it is over pressure and when you say toxic uh, it is toxicity levels okay uh, we have these levels with us Th we have frequency also with us so now we will be combining these two and we will get the values okay so values will be something like this like say 2.5 into 10 power minus 4 or minus 3 or minus 5 or something like that this is the value what we will be getting out of it the risk value okay same this is for ir and for societal risk as i said it will be like uh, this frequency and number of fatalities these are the two values we will be getting out of that particular then based on this we will be going ahead with analyzing the control measures that are there in place okay which had given this value so now we will try to add some layer to it to reduce the risk values that we know we did for that particular oil terminal uh, where that uh, we found that the risk was uh, more in the uh, rail wagon unloading area why why can you just guess why I will just hint, I uh, will give you an hint. There was a railway station nearby. Normal, regular railway station was there. Anyway, railway line, when you say railway railway wagon unloading, they, it should be some, some somewhere nearby a, a regular rail, right? A railway network. So, there was a railway station nearby where you will have population, movement, movement of population always, uh, the people will be there, right? So, when you calculate the risk, automatically those numbers will come into our calculations, right? And we will go for as assuming maximum number of people in the railway station. Like when I, when I do analysis, I take two trains standing in the station at that time of e event, mishap, okay? So, automatically it aided in that. So, then we had suggested some more risk control measures to isolate that wagon from that particular area like providing some barriers on the other side providing some additional fire protection measures to bring down the risk bring down the risk in the sense some mitigation measures so that even though the people are there that much number of people are there in any in the event of any emergency at the time of emergency the risk is under this level got it interestingly i did one other project in north india where it was close to an airport so, so we need to ask, we were forced to assume some number of flights uh, in the airport at any point of time and occupancy of each flight and in case if the flight takes off or uh, lands at that moment of any emergency because that uh, station was fueling the airport, uh, the the, it was uh, supplying to airport. Aviation turbine fuel is the maximum stored material there in that uh, storage terminal. We did some assumptions and then we came up with the risk values. Well, so, these, these are some of the things which we normally consider and in one another interesting project it was a cross country pipeline. So, we need to calculate the number of people located in that particular area. So, we just uh, allocated some days for that we had gone around some uh, around uh, maybe say you can say uh, the entire 20-30 uh, kilometers radius. We did some assumptions like how many houses are there in each house if four people are there what will be the number of people who will be located in that uh, radius of 20-30 uh, meters and then we used that population details for our calculations. So, those kind of uh, things will happen in this analysis. So, we need to assume sometimes we go to the field, we collect this information and then we do some assumptions again with that and then we complete the analysis. Okay? So, this is with respect to the terminals. So, when I come to the process uh, QRA, as I had mentioned in the pharmaceutical industry, it is a, it is a, uh, maybe API. Do you know API? Have you heard about API? Active pharmaceutical ingredient, 
Uh, being a chemical engineer, our, uh, apart from oil and gas, our focus is next to, next to oil and gas, it is pharma, right? As a chemical engineer, right? Okay. So, in pharma, there are uh, three different types of uh, uh, operations that happens. One is bulk drug, major is bulk drug and second is formulations. In between bulk drug and formulations is active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs. So, bulk drug is something which is produced in a very, the name implies, right? It is produced in large quantities, okay? And uh, APIs are some few ingredients which has to be added in between the process. So, that will be again produced separately. And then in formulations is the final one which you get as injectables or tablets or whatever it is. You are formulating it to the dose level, okay? So, th this different, uh, this particular uh, project what we did was for a API industry. Uh, uh, the particular uh, plant was uh, manufacturing API. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, it's a very small. Uh, the entire uh, plant, uh, that section which was subjected to QRA is this much. This uh, this the room size. Okay, but multiple uh, process vessels were there, and each process vessel was handling different chemicals, like starting from toluene, ethanol. All these uh, hazardous chemicals were there inside the facility. We did a QRA, where. We, we again applied all the same, uh, the procedures, whatever I had mentioned, starting from frequency analysis, consequence analysis, everything is, uh, was done. But since the occupancy level was less, you can imagine, the, frequent, the risk values were not uh, alarming. But still, we did a thorough QRA and came up with, a, we analyzed all the risk control measures that are there. And we had suggested some more risk control measures to keep the risk under control. <laughs> the risk was under the alarm region or acceptable region. But we had suggested some more uh, risk control measures to keep the risk control control. Okay, so examples of those risk control measures is, say in case of a leak, the vapors will come out. There are some few operators they, who will be located inside the room. So what, what, what is the type of control that can come in? Just can you guess? Leak yeah, exactly. Leak detectors has to be there to detect and alarm the operators, give an annunciation. Uh, what else? To avoid accumulation, what is what should be there? Ah, so exhaust has to be there, uh, and uh, it has to be a mechanized uh, mechanical ventilation there. Something has to get activated or triggered, and that has to blow out the vapors or gas from the room. Okay, all these we had come up with our uh, suggestions to interlock things like uh, leak detectors to the exhaust system and things like that, and also to provide. Uh, all the, the the light the electrical fixtures have you heard about the classification of electrical fixtures <coughs> okay now these all i am just referring because you need to go back and look for all these things as a chemical engineer we should know all these things okay <coughs> uh, when you say classification there are different zones which are identified in a hazardous uh, atmosphere zone 0 zone 1 zone 2 these are the three major classifications. When you say zone 0, uh, which is a place where uh, at any point of time, the flammable atmosphere will be there. Like the place inside a storage tank, where the material is there. Okay? And just uh, when, when there is a, uh, ha when the handling of this uh, flammable material happens, that those areas are termed under zone 1. Okay? And only during a mishap, if something comes out, Okay, occasionally those areas are zone zero, the zone two. Sorry, zone two. So, uh, so now you can can you imagine what is that area? That process area would have been that uh, pharma wherever the process was uh, taking place. Now I am not just going in detail. I am just touching upon and uh, trying to connect uh, this with that. Okay, that is a zone zero atmosphere because the entire area is filled can or is being uh, occupied with that particular flammable chemicals, right? So, all the fixtures, they need to be of that particular nature. They need to have the, all the arrangements not to act as an ignition source, okay? So, those type of electrical fixtures, we call it as classified electrical fixtures, okay? There is a separate study for that, we call it as hazardous area classification, HAC, which has to be done by a team of electrical engineer and a chemical engineer. Both has to be there to do the study, and we do that study in our uh, company. Okay, so 
those types of uh, analysis uh, we had suggested that as a measure like they need to go for the uh, this particular type of electrical fixtures inside the process area okay so the, this is another example apart from this another Q, uh, study what we did for a qr uh, the refinery that that particular refinery is a very uh, big refinery as of now they are going for an expansion to increase their throughput okay uh, so so they had uh, gone ahead with the modifications in the existing units like say have you heard about the crude distillation units fccu cdus right definitely you might be aware of it because distillation without this distillation doesn't happen right so when you say cdu they had gone ahead with adding a, another cdu another fccu all these additions so they will be connecting this interconnecting pipeline all these happened so they asked us to do the analysis so we had identified the critical sections which are connecting the old ones with the new ones okay so if something goes wrong in that what will be the impact to old ones as well as the new ones and also to the people around because that is required that was required by the government so we did that analysis again the, the logic remains same leaks okay so when you say leaks leaks can happen in different sizes as i said it starts from 2 mm 7 mm 22 mm and it goes up to 70 and uh, when we say full bore rupture it is complete rupture complete collapse of tank or uh, pipeline okay so different leak sizes we used to calculate the uh, release rates and then the frequency analysis will be the uh, frequency will be multiplied with the results of con consequence then we came up with the values uh, interestingly uh, there were some uh, concern in the societal risk there so then then again we did a, lo a lot of research and analysis to bring down that particular thing like what we need to suggest to the client for him to bring down the risk because unless until he brings down that he comes up with an action plan government will not uh, clear that particular project so they did that and then it was cleared okay so this is how we do normally uh, the qra and this, these are the end users uh, end users of this study and this is where the risk assessment ends in total okay and it doesn't stop here uh, this assessments has to happen uh, uh, there are some periodicity okay in in uh, in india uh, now recently there was a, a regulation laid down by the government like all these uh, major accident hazard installations mh installations they need to go for a qra study qra and hazop study once in 5 years that a timeline fixed by them uh, i don't know maybe some with some baseline uh, in, uh, data what they have with them okay uh, so now what uh, the thing is uh, apart from this whenever there is a new project coming up the qra has to happen hazop and qra has to happen whenever uh, there is a modification again the qra and hazop has to happen okay and uh, as i said once in 5 years it has that periodicity again defined by certain uh, regulations in uh, in uh, overseas uh, the the periodicity is different okay and uh, apart from this as a assessor if you ask me uh, we need to do this qra when the plant is decommissioned whenever we are going to stop the operations we need to assess the risk what will or what will we need to assess what are the impact of decommissioning that particular system so what will happen okay so these are the stages or phases of this study like when all it will be done in a life cycle of a particular plant or operation okay got it so this is this is the key study in the entire process hazard analysis we term it as pha it starts with hazard study hazard identification study then goes further hazop when you say hazard along with that you would have heard about the what if safety audits checklist all these things will be part of the hazard identification moving further we go ahead with the hazop study hazard and operability study okay and further we had discussed about the lopa layer of protection analysis and then comes the quantitative risk analysis so first is qualitative then the semi qualitative and then comes the quantitative so with this the entire hazard analysis ends and all these results will be used for various purposes okay um, having discussed this you need to know the limitations of this study 
it's not that completely it's valid as i had said uh, we will be doing the sensitivity analysis these are some of the limitations that we face or that we have when we do this study like methodology i will i will follow a certain methodology but that can, that may not be followed by another risk assessor when he does that particular study okay so methodology varies and also a standard based on the standard that is being adopted like if i follow cpr 18e that methodology will be different and if i follow ogp database or ogp directory the methodology will be different so depending uh, depending upon the ease uh, we will even uh, we we also used to select the methodology depending upon the ease uh, that is required for us okay so methodology is a key thing environmental conditions as i said uh, wind velocity and wind stability wind speed and wind stability if you go for coastal areas the things will be different inversion will be more do you remember yesterday we were discussing about the inversions okay so the the change in the land breeze and sea breeze uh, conditions okay that will be more in coastal than in the interior parts of the uh, plains okay so those things will come into picture and even the the rainfall like when we do analysis in uh, northeast uh, locations like assam guwahati there which where we have uh, the maximum amount of rainfall in a year the dispersion rate will change automatically right so all these things will have an impact on the analysis okay and frequency database again that that particular database has to be updated every now and then like regular updation has to happen in the database so if i use a 10 year old uh, database uh, it is it, it may be invalid because i uh, there might be a recently updated uh, database that will be available in the uh, industry right so the selection of frequency database is critical okay and software models <coughs> whatever models we have discussed the source model dispersion model it is set of equations okay these set of equations are keyed in in the software as i said uh, we are using a dnv supplied software called fast full version the, the abbreviation of fast is preliminary Pro process hazard analysis software tool that's it p h a s t okay uh so this uh, there are some other softwares also in the market like companies like uh, shell shell has their own uh, software shell fred is there uh, you people would have come across aloha right any time you, did you do happen to do any analysis with aloha no okay Th those are the softwares which are used for dispersion aloha kalpuff aromad are there for just exclusively for dispersion modeling and whatever i had mentioned earlier this fast shellfred and many more are there I, i i i don't want to refer all those softwares here because these are the the two uh, the ones uh, which i had referred is the leading leaders in the analysis okay so these softwares will put all the equations together in each model okay and then they will come up with the we we, we could see the front end of the particular software that's it at the back end multiple uh, equations and multiple iterations will be going on when we key in a data okay and uh, for the ease of developing a software they may they would have skipped something they would have assumed something okay so there may be some uh, fraction of error in the results if i do uh, the same analysis with different softwares i will get different results that is because of this particular uh, 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 the change in the assumptions or the the use of equations in the models in the software okay but the, the, there will be some uh, uh, variation uh, but definitely the, the accuracy level will be could be compared we can compare one software with other and we could uh, assume some things what where it would have gone wrong which equation it would have gone wrong that could be done by a assessor based on his experience okay so that is one thing and scenario selection as i had given an example that uh, tanker pipeline storage tank instead of selecting in this fashion if i if i select a section of pipeline like say i if i split that pipeline into three pieces automatically my risk value will come down because the quantity is uh, coming down right the inventory is coming down okay so you need to have that experience to select the scenarios like this this scenario if i select it will it will give me a valid uh, result i could use this for a valid analysis or assessment so that scenario selection it comes based on experience uh, or 
till people gain experience they use the feti index have you heard of, uh, about the dow index as a chemical engineer you should uh, know all these things again go back to peris uh, chemical engineers handbook there is a section called process safety go back have a look read through the process safety section it's i, I think 90 95 pages uh, it's there these these all information will be there in that uh, section i i hope you would have used peri right day in day out that is our bible as a chemical engineer till now no nothing has replaced uh, peri till now uh, am i right uh, right so so you go back and see that section i remember somewhere at 27th or uh, 26th chapter i think you just have a look at it okay uh, there the dow index is also discussed in uh, in short uh, that uh, index is nothing but fire and explosion toxicity index okay so there we use that formula for calculating the hazard index like come we'll come up with the hazard number so some number will be derived out of that calculation okay using that number we'll categorize the hazards okay so then the high severe ones are, are the the, num- the maximum number ones will be there no we'll be selecting that and we'll be uh, capturing it for scenario selection we'll use those scenarios for our study some clients they ask for it they will ask us to do the uh selection scenario selection using a feti which is an additional work but that is a reliable one because you use some numbers there and based on which we come up with another final number for hazard hazard number will be there and based on the numbering uh, we will be going ahead with the uh, scenario selection the highest ones will be picked up first least ones will be m- skipped because it's not required when the hazard is lesser we don't need to go for that those scenarios for analysis okay so these are some of the limitations it purely it is based on the people who get involved in this analysis or assessment uh, the outcome of the study it depends of, uh, on the experience of the people getting involved in the analysis okay just just nothing uh, uh, to record this is the major gap still we face in india between the studies what we do in overseas and in india okay so there are uh, things very much clear in overseas they have guidelines they have databases they have ru- they they define everything like whatever i had said no i will assume this i will assume that they gave they they are giving us directions to assume the particular thing you they will say you assume this that's it don't go beyond that so that the, the, there will be a standardization in the entire activity okay and then with the with all those uh, standardized uh, process and procedures our outcome will also be standard if i do or some x or y or whomsoever does that act, uh, analysis the result will be same okay even they define the software that has to be used for the analysis version of the software also is defined which version of the software has to be used for their particular activity okay so uh, still all these are yet to come up or uh, it's sensitized in our uh, place okay so we'll just have a look at the bp i think you i hope you people would have gone through the bp animation right bp incident texas incident yeah. we'll again go through that but we now with relevance to qra we'll discuss about that just At about 2 a.m. on March 23, 2005, isomerization unit operators began introducing highly flammable liquid hydrocarbons into the raffinate splitter tower. In normal operations, only about six and a half feet of liquid should be present in the bottom of the tower. Near the base of the tower, there was a level indicator that measured how much liquid was inside and transmitted this information to the control room. However, This indicator was not designed to measure any liquid above the 10-foot mark, and above that point, operators would have no idea how high or how dangerous the level was. 
A high-level alarm activated and sounded in the control room when the tower overfilled, but a second redundant alarm failed to activate. By 3.30 a.m., the feed was stopped, and the level indicator showed that the liquid had filled the bottom 10 feet of the tower. We now know that this indicator was not providing accurate readings. We calculate that the tower was actually filled above the range of the indicator to a height of about 13 feet. At about 9.50 a.m., operators began circulating the liquid feed and adding more liquid to the already full tower. Even though the liquid was going into the tower, there was no flow out as specified in the startup procedures. The valve that controlled the liquid flow out of the tower was left closed. Ten minutes later, at about 10 a.m., operators lit burners on the furnace to begin heating up the feed, part of the normal process. Unknown to operators, the tower continued to fill rapidly with liquid to more than 20 times the normal level. We now calculate that the level reached 138 feet inside the tower, while the inaccurate level indicator told operators that the liquid was below 10 feet and falling. Around 12.40 p.m., a high-pressure alarm was activated. Two burners were turned off in the furnace to lower the temperature. The valve specified in the procedures for controlling pressure didn't work so an operator used a manual chain valve to vent gases to the blowdown drum and into the atmosphere. At about 1 p.m., operators opened the valve to send liquid from the bottom of the tower to storage tanks. This should have improved conditions inside the flooded tower, but the liquid at the bottom of the tower was very hot, and as it exited through the heat exchanger, it suddenly raised the temperature of the feed going into the tower by over 150 degrees. By 1.05 p.m., the liquid entering the tower was beginning to boil and expand, causing the level inside the tower to increase further. At 1.10 p.m., the tower began overflowing liquid into the piping off the top of the tower. Liquid built up in this vertical piping and exerted great pressure on the emergency relief valves 150 feet below. At 1.14 p.m., the three emergency valves opened and liquid began flooding the blowdown drum at the other end of the isomerization unit. Some liquid overflowed from the blowdown drum into a processed sewer. But the high-level alarm on the blowdown drum didn't go off. The drum filled completely and bystanders saw a geyser-like eruption from the top of the blowdown stack. The eruption lasted about one minute. Liquid fell to the ground, creating a large flammable vapor cloud. This model predicts how far the vapor cloud expanded across the area just one minute after the release began from the stack. At 1.20 p.m., the cloud ignited, causing a series of explosions. This is what is the one which will be analyzing purely. <coughs> so we will be seeing uh, where all the ignition sources will be there and what is the possibility of that particular cloud in, if at all if any leak ha had happened, uh, what is the possibility of that particular uh, cloud getting ignited or uh, the liquid getting ignited. Okay, you, you would have seen that simulation, right? That is a 3D modeling, 3D simulation. Uh, still we haven't uh, started using that, uh, only for few projects we are using it. Uh, so that is a full-fledged uh, modeling which is coming up in the market right now. So which uses a 3D model where you can ask, we can see exactly how the leak happens and what will be the propagation, the direction of propagation, rate of propagation and what is the possibilities of it, uh, it getting ignited. Okay. The CSB believes the vapor cloud was most likely ignited by a diesel pickup truck parked about 25 feet from the blowdown drum. The next computer simulation shows how the blast pressure wave is predicted to have moved after the cloud was ignited. The blast pressure wave is accelerating as it moves through the ISOM unit, causing heavy destruction and igniting more fires. This is the area where two trailers were destroyed, fatally injuring 15 contract workers. This videotape shot by Houston station KHOU, 
shows the ISOM unit as fires continue to burn after the explosion. You can see the blowdown stack still emitting flames as hydrocarbons are released. Several vehicles were set on fire and burned in the aftermath. Over 50 large chemical storage tanks were damaged. Firefighters struggled to rescue the injured and locate the missing. The Chemical Safety Board's investigation to determine the root causes of the tragedy began the following day. Okay, so what happened was uh, the, they, they had located the trailers uh, nearby that uh, raffinate tower, hardly 15-20 meters from the raffinate tower, which was suppo uh, not supposed to be. Like uh, they, those trailers should not be there and if at all if they would have allowed them, they should have been provided with all the flame arresters and things like that. Do you remember the flame arresters the very first day we were discussing? Okay, so all these things uh, would have come out uh, uh, if they would have carried out the uh, QRA there for that particular point or at that particular point of time. Though they had a practice of doing it, they haven't followed that in that particular instance. So that uh, they didn't, uh, they couldn't get the gravity of the thing, like what can happen or what can go, go wrong or if something goes wrong, what will be the impact, they couldn't come out with that uh, inference. So this had happened and now it had been inter investigated and uh, we are seeing the animation here how it had happened. Okay, so QRA would have helped them in citing the particular trailers, like how far they should have parked the trailers, and where from they should have operated the particular uh, activity or carried out that particular activity. Okay, if they would have carried out the QRA, it would have helped them to locate the trailers at a particular or safe location. Okay, I'll just uh, run through another uh, video, uh, just uh, it's just for information only, uh, because it's particular software's uh, thing. Uh, so. How the software works. Okay, just have a look. Uh, nothing in detail, just an introductory video. Unfortunately, small and large accidents still happen at many facilities around the world. Accidents that could have been prevented or at least mitigated. At DMP Software, not only do we make world-leading software that could have prevented this accident, it is DMP's purpose to safeguard life, property, and the environment. And we deliver this in our software products. FAST is the leading solution for hazard analysis, which enables thousands of users worldwide to make our world a safer place to live. What if we could go back and analyze the hazards on the facility to better understand the potential failures we could experience? Using FAST from DMP software, we can perform extensive consequence analysis to investigate and understand our potential losses. What would happen if this pipework connected to a pressurized storage tank failed, resulting in a leak? FAST contains a complete suite of linked discharge, dispersion, toxic, explosion, and flammable effect models. All models are continuous. Discharge is the source model. Experimental data. Details of the accidental release will be calculated, including discharge, low conditions, cloud and wall formation, and behavior of effect results relating to any toxic, flammable, and explosive hazards. This leak could ignite immediately, leading to a fireball or jet fire, or a cloud could develop, leading to a flash fire, explosion, or toxic impact. These results can be shown over GIS image data, including satellite photographs and CAD block plans. We use Google Images for this. Knowledge of the nature and extent of hazard zones arising from potential loss of containment is key information for legislative compliance and prevention and mitigation of events. The extensive consequence analysis results from FAST will help you make informed decisions about maintenance and inspection strategies, emergency response, and plant layout. FAST is the complete solution for okay. hazard analysis of your process plant, allowing you to efficiently and effectively analyze. Let's stop here.
I think marketing is because <laughs> we, they are our competitors. Uh, just to give you an give you an idea or a feel of how it works. And uh, till now uh, in India, we we don't have anyone who had uh, because the Aloha and things like that are very preliminary level softwares. Uh, we we haven't come up with this level of complicated softwares in India. Maybe you people can think of it and at a later stage. Still, whatever we use are the ones which had been developed by people overseas, not here. Huh? Okay. I'll just again. I'll just run through one more video. We were discussing about Blevy, right? Just have a look at it. How Blevy happens. This is how this happens, and this had happened in phasing. Okay. This will be too. Uh, the impact will be more compared to the normal explosion. Because the projectiles will be there, the impact due to the, the material thrown out of the particular area. It's not there. Okay. Fine. So that's all from my side. Uh, so maybe you, I'll just leave it to you. Uh, if at all, if anything you need to get it clarified, you can just let me know. Uh, can we? Yeah. Anything? Anything you would like to clarify? Uh, 